Chapter 10 At the costume ball in Shanghai, four mile of Ceres electrified society by appearing as Death in Durer's Death and the Maiden, with a dazzling blonde creature clad in transparent veils. A Victorian society, which stifled its women in Perda, and which regarded the 1920s gown of Pinamide clan as excessively daring, was shocked, despite the fact that Robin Winsbury was chaperoning the pair. But when Four Mile revealed that the female was a magnificent android, there was an instant reversal of opinion in his favor. Society was delighted with the deception. The naked body, shameful in humans, was merely a sexless curiosity in androids. At midnight, Four Mile auctioned off the android to the gentleman of the ball. The money to go to charity, Four Mile? Certainly not. You know my slogan. Not one cent for entropy. Do I hear a hundred credits for this expensive and lovely creature? One hundred, gentlemen? She's all beauty and highly adaptable. Two? Thank you. Three and a half. Thank you. I'm bid. Five? Eight. Thank you. Any more bids for this remarkable product of the resident genius of the Four Mile Circus? She walks. She talks. She adapts. She has been conditioned to respond to the highest bidders and whim. Nine? Do I hear any more bids? Are you all done? Are you all through? All right. Sold to Lord Yale for 900 credits. Tumultuous applause and appalling ciphering. An android like that must have cost 90,000. How can he afford it? Will you turn the money over to the android, Lord Yale? She will respond suitably. Until we meet again in Rome, ladies and gentlemen. The Borghese Palace at midnight. Happy New Year. Foyle had already departed when Lord Yale had discovered, to the delight of himself and the other bachelors, that a double deception had been perpetuated. The android was, in fact, a living human creature, all beauty and highly adaptable. She responded magnificently to 900 credits. The trick was the smoking room story of the year. The stags waited eagerly to congratulate Four Mile. But Foyle and Robin Winsbury were passing under a sign that read, Double your jaunting or double your money back, in seven languages, and entering the emporium of Dr. Sergei Orl, celestial and larger of cranial capabilities. The waiting room was decorated with lurid brain charts demonstrating how Dr. Orl poulticed, cupped, bassoned, and electrolyzed the brain into double its capacity or double your money back. He also doubled your money with anti-fertile purgatives, magnified your morals with tonic robotorants, and adjusted all anguished psyches with Oral's epilotic vulnerary. The waiting room was empty. Foyle opened a door at a venture. He and Robin had glimpsed a long hospital ward. Foyle grunted in disgust. A snow joint. Might have known he'd be running a dive for hopheads, too. The den catered to disease collectors, the most hopeless of neurotic addicts. They lay in their hospital beds, suffering mildly from illegally induced paramezels, paraflu, paramalaria, devotedly attended by nurses in starch white uniforms, and avidly enjoying their illegal illness and the attention it brought. Look at them, Foyle said contemptuously. Disgusting. If there's anything filthier than a religion junkie, it's a disease bird. Good evening, a voice spoke behind him. Foyle shut the door and turned. Dr. Sergei Oral bowed. The good doctor was crisp and sterile in the classic white cap, gown, and surgical mask of the medical clans, to which he belonged by fraudulent assertion only. He was short, swarthy, and olive-eyed, recognizably Russian by his name alone. More than a century of jaunting had so mingled the many populations of the world that racial types were disappearing. Didn't expect to find you open for business on New Year's Eve, Foyle said. Our Russian New Year comes two weeks later, Dr. Oral answered. Step this way, please. He pointed to a door and disappeared with a pop. The door revealed a long flight of stairs. As Foyle and Robin started up the stairs, Dr. Oral appeared above them. This way, please. Oh, one moment. He disappeared and appeared again behind them. You forgot to close the door. He shut the door and jaunted again. This time, he reappeared high at the head of the stairs. In here, please. 
Showing off, Foyle muttered. Double your jaunting or double your money back. All the same, he's pretty fast. I'll have to be faster. They entered the consultation room. It was a glass roof penthouse. The walls were lined with gaudy but antiquated medical apparatuses. A sedative bath machine. An electric chair for administrating shock treatment to schizophrenics. An EKG analyzer for tracing psychotic patterns. Old optical and electronic microscopes. The quack waited for them behind his desk. He jaunted to the door, closed it, jaunted back to his desk, bowed, indicated chairs, jaunted behind Robbins and held it for her, jaunted to the window and adjusted the shade, jaunted to the light switch and adjusted the lights, then reappeared behind his desk. One year ago, he smiled, I could not jaunt at all. Then I discovered the secret, the sulfateris absative, which... Foyle touched his tongue to the switchboard wired into the nerve endings of his teeth. He accelerated. He arose without haste, stepped to the slow motion figure. Blue Falling. Behind the desk, took out a heavy sap and scientifically smoked oral across the brow concussing the frontal lobes and stunning the jaunt center. He picked the quack up and strapped him into the electric chair. All this took approximately five seconds. To Robin Winsbury, it was a blur of motion. Foyle decelerated. The quack opened his eyes, stirred, discovered where he was, and started in anger and perplexity. You're Sergei Oral, pharmacist mate off the Vorga, Foyle said quietly. You were aboard the Vorga on September 16th. 2436. The anger and perplexity turned to terror. On September 16th, you passed a wreck, out near the asteroid belt. It was the wreck of the Nomad. She signaled for help, and Vorga passed her by. You left her to drift and die. Why? Oral rolled his eyes, but did not answer. Who gave you the order to pass me by? Who was willing to let me rot and die? Oral began to gibber. Who was aboard Vorga? Who shipped with you? Who is in command? I'm going to get an answer. Don't you think I'm not? Foyle said with calm ferocity. I'll buy it, or I'll tear it out of you. Why was I left to die? Who told you to let me die? Oral screamed. I can't talk about... Wait, I'll tell... He sagged. Foyle examined the body. Dead, he muttered, just when he was ready to talk. Just like forced. Murdered. No, I never touched him. It was suicide. Foyle cackled without humor. You're insane. No, amused. I didn't kill them. I forced them to kill themselves. What nonsense is that? They've been given sympathetic blocks. You know about SBs, girl? Intelligence uses them for espionage agents. Take a certain body of information you don't want to be told. Link it with sympathetic nervous system that controls automatic respiration and heartbeat. As soon as the subject tries to reveal that information, the heart and lungs stop. The man dies. Your secret's kept. An agent doesn't have to worry about killing himself to avoid torture. It's been done for him. It was done to these men? Obviously. But why? How do I know? Refugee running isn't the answer. Vorga must have been operating worse rackets than that to take this precaution. But we've got a problem. Our last lead is Poggi in Rome. Angelo Poggi. Chef's assistant off the Vorga. How are we going to get that information out of him without... He broke off. His image stood before him. Silent, ominous, face burning, blood red, clothes flaming. Foyle was paralyzed. He took a breath and spoke in a shaking voice. Who are you? What are you? The image disappeared. Foyle turned to Robin, moistening his lips. Did you see it? Her expression answered him. Was it real? She pointed to Sergei Oral's desk, alongside which the image had stood. Papers on the desk had caught fire and were burning briskly. 
Foyle backed away, still frightened and bewildered. He passed a hand across his face. It came away wet. Robin rushed to the desk and tried to beat out the flames. She picked up wads of paper and letters and slammed helplessly. Foyle did not move. I can't stop it, she gasped at last. We gotta get out of here. Foyle nodded and then pulled himself together with power and resolution. Rome, he croaked. We jaunt to Rome. There's got to be some explanation for this. I'll find it by God. And in the meantime, I'm not quitting. Rome. Go, girl. Jaunt. Since the Middle Ages, the Spanish stairs had been the center of corruption in Rome. Rising from the Piazza di Spagna to the gardens of the Villa Borghese, the Spanish stairs are, have been, and always will be, swarming with vice. Pimps lounge on their stairs, whores, perverts, lesbians, catamites. Insolent and arrogant, they display themselves and jeer at the respectables who sometimes pass. The Spanish stairs were destroyed in the fission wars of the late 20th century. They were rebuilt and destroyed again in the War of the World Restoration and the 21st century. Once more they were rebuilt, and this time covered with blast-proof crystal, turning the stairs into a stepped galleria. The dome of the galleria cut off the view from the death chamber in Keats' house. No longer would visitors peep through the narrow window and see the last sight that met the dying poet's eyes. Now they saw the smoky dome of the Spanish stairs, and through it, the distorted figures of corruption below. The gallery of stairs was illuminated at night, and this New Year's Eve was chaotic. For a thousand years, Rome had welcomed the New Year with a bombardment. Firecrackers, rockets, torpedoes, gunshots, bottles, shoes, old pots and pans. For months, Romans saved junk to be hurled out of top floor windows, when midnight strikes. The roar of fireworks inside the stairs and the clatter of debris clashing on the Galleria roof were deafening as Foyle and Robin Winsbury climbed down from the carnival in the Borghese Palace. They were still in costume, Foyle in the livid crimson and black tights and doublé of Caesar Borgia, Robin wearing the silver-encrusted gown of Lucrezia Borgia. They wore grotesque velvet mask. The contrast between the Renaissance costumes and the modern clothes around them brought forth jeers and catcalls. Even the lobos who frequented the Spanish stairs, the unfortunate habitual criminals who had a quarter of their brains burnt out by prefrontal lobotomy, were aroused from their dreary apathy to stare. The crowd seethed around the couple as they descended into the galleria. Poggi, Foyle called quietly. Angelo Poggi. A bald, bellowed anatomical adjurations at him. Poggi! Angelo Poggi! Foyle was impassive. I'm told he can be found on the stairs at night. Angelo Poggi! A whore maligned his mother. Angelo Poggi! Ten credits to anyone who can bring him to me. Foyle was ringed with extended hands, some filthy, some scented, all greedy. He shook his head. Show me first. Roman rage cackled all around him. Poggi. Angelo Poggi. After six weeks of loitering on the Spanish stairs, Captain Peter Yang Yavel at last heard the words he had hoped to hear. Six weeks of tedious assumption of the identity of one Angelo Poggi, chef's assistant off the Vorga, long dead, was finally paying off. It had been a gamble, first risked when intelligence had brought the news to Captain Yang Yavel that someone was making cautious inquiries about the crew of the Prestigian Vorga and paying heavily for information. It's a long shot, Ying Yobo had said, but Gully Foil, AS-128-127-006, 
did make that lunatic attempt to blow up Volga, and twenty pounds of pyro is worth a long shot. Now he waddled up the stairs towards the man of the Renaissance costume and mask. He had put on forty pounds weight with glandular shots. He had darkened his complexion with diet manipulation. His features, never of oriental caste, but cut more along the hawk-like lines of the ancient American Indian, easily fell into an unreliable pattern with a little muscular control. The intelligence man waddled up the Spanish stairs, a gross cook with a larse in his countenance. He extended a package of soiled envelopes towards foil. Filthy picture, senor. Cellar Christians, kneeling, praying, singing psalms, kissing cross. Very naughty. Very smutty, senor. Entertain your friends. Excite the ladies. No. Foyle brushed the pornography aside. I'm looking for Angelo Poggi. Yang Yavel signaled microscopically. His crew on the stairs began photographing and recording the interview without ceasing its pimping and whoring. The secret speech of the intelligence tong of the inner planet's armed forces wigwagged around Foyle and Robin in a hail of tiny ticks, sniffs, gestures, attitudes, motions. It was the ancient Chinese sign language of eyelids, eyebrows, fingertips, and infinitesimal body motions. Senor? Yang Yavo wheezed. Angelo Poggi? Si, senor. I am Angelo Poggi. Chef's assistant of the Vorga? Expecting the same start of terror manifested by force and oral, which he had last understood, Foyle shot out a hand and grabbed Yang Yavo's elbow. Yes? Si, senor, Yang Yavo replied tranquilly. How can I serve your worship? Maybe this one can come through, Foyle murmured to Robin. He's not scared. Maybe he knows a way around the block. I want information from you, Poji. Of what nature, senor? And at what price? I want to buy all you've got. Anything you've got. Name your price. But, senor, I am a man full of years and experience. I am not to be bought in wholesale lots. I must be paid item by item. Make your selection and I will name the price. What do you want? You were aboard the Vorga on September 16th, 2436. The cost of that item is 10 credits. Foyle smiled mirthlessly and paid. I was, senor. I want to know about a ship you passed out near the asteroid belt. The wreck of the Nomad. You passed her on September 16th. Nomad signaled for help and Vorga passed her by. Who gave that order? Ah, senor. Who gave you that order and why? Why do you ask, senor? Never mind why I ask. Name the price and talk. I must know why a question is asked before I answer, senor. Yang Yavo smiled greasily. And I will pay for my caution by cutting the price. Why are you interested in Vorga and Nomad and this shocking abandonment in space? Were you perhaps the unfortunate who was so cruelly treated? He's not Italian. His accent's perfect, but the speech pattern's all wrong. No Italian would frame sentences like that. Foyle stiffened in alarm. Yang Yavel's eyes, sharpened to detect and deduce from Anusha, caught the change in attitude. He realized at once that he had slipped somehow. He signaled to his crew urgently. A white-hot brawl broke out on the Spanish stairs. In an instant, Foyle and Robin were caught up in a screaming, struggling mob. The crews of the intelligence tong were part masters of this OPI maneuver, designed to outwit a jaunting world. Their split-second timing could knock any man off balance and strip him for identification. Their success was based on the simple fact that between an unexpected assault and defense response, there must always be a recognition lag. Within the space of that lag, the intelligence tongue guaranteed to prevent any man from saving himself. In three-fifths of a second, Foyle was battered, kneed, hammered across the forehead, dropped to the steps and spread eagle. The mask was plucked from his face, portions of his clothes torn away, and he was ripe and helpless for the rape of identification cameras. Then, for the first time in the history of the Tong, their schedule was interrupted. 
A man appeared, straddling Foyle's body. A huge man with a hideously tattooed face and clothes that smoked and flamed. The apparition was so appalling that the crew stopped dead and stared. A howl went up from the crowd on the stairs at the dreadful spectacle. The Burning Man! Look! The Burning Man! But that's Foyle, Yang Yavo whispered. For perhaps a quarter of a minute, the apparition stood, silent, burning, staring with blind eyes. Then it disappeared. The man spread eagle on the ground disappeared too. He turned into a lightning blur of action that whipped through the crew, locating and destroying cameras, recorders, all identification apparatus. Then the blur seized the girl in the Renaissance gown and vanished. The Spanish stairs came to life again, painfully, as though struggling out of a nightmare. The bewildered intelligence crew clustered around Yang Yabel. What in God's name was that, Yao? I think it was our man, Gully Foyle. You saw that tattooed face? And the burning clothes! Christ Almighty! Look like a witch at the stake! But if that burning man was foiled, who the hell were we wasting our time on? I don't know. Does the Commando Brigade have an intelligence service that haven't bothered to mention to us? Why the Commandos, Yao? You saw the way he accelerated, didn't you? He destroyed every record we made. I still can't believe my eyes. Oh, you can believe what you didn't see, all right. That was top secret commando technique. They take their men apart and rewire and re-gear them. I'll have to check with Mars HQ and find out whether Commando Brigade's running a parallel investigation. Does the Army tell the Navy? They tell intelligence, Yang Yobble said angrily. This case is critical enough without jurisdictional hassles. And another thing, there was no need to manhandle that girl in the maneuver. It was undisciplined and unnecessary. Yang Yavo paused, for once unaware of the significant glances passing around him. I must find out who she is, he added dreamily. If she's been re-geared too, it'll be real interesting, Yao, a bland voice, markedly devoid of implication, said. Boy meets commando. Yang Yavo flushed. All right, he blurted. I'm transparent. Just repetitious, Yao. All your romances start the same way. There's no need to manhandle that girl. And then, Dolly Quaker, Gene Webster, Gwyn Rodgett. No names, please, a shocked voice interrupted. Does Romeo tell Juliet? You're all going on latrine assignment tomorrow, Yang Alva said. I'm damned if I'll stand for this salacious insubordination. No, not tomorrow, but as soon as this case is closed. His hawk face darkened. My god, what a mess. Will you ever forget Foyle standing there like a burning brand? But where is he? What's he up to? What's it all mean? Chapter 11 Prestige of Prestige's mansion in Central Park was ablaze for the new year. Charming antique electric bulbs with zigzag filaments and pointed tips shed yellow light. The jaunt-proof maze had been removed, and the great door was open for the special occasion. The interior of the house was protected from the gaze of the crowd outside by a jeweled screen just inside the door. The sightseers buzzed and exclaimed as the famous and near-famous of clan and sept arrived by car, by coach, by litter, by every form of luxurious transportation. Prestigian of Prestigian himself stood before the door, iron gray, handsome, smiling his basilisk smile, and welcomed society to his open house. Hardly had a celebrity stepped through the door and disappeared behind the screen when another, even more famous, came clattering up in a vehicle even more fabulous. The Colas arrived in bandwagons. The Esso family, six sons, three daughters, was magnificent in a glass-topped Greyhound bus. But Greyhound arrived, and an Edison electric runabout, hard on their heels, and there was much laughter and chafing at the door. But when Edison of Westinghouse dismounted from his Esso-fueled gasoline buggy, completing the circle, the laughter on the steps turned into a roar. Just as the crowd of guests turned to enter Prestigian's home, a distant commotion attracted their attention. It was a rumble, a fierce chatter of pneumatic punches, and an outrageous metallic bellowing. It approached rapidly. 
The outer fringe of the sightseers opened a broad lane. A heavy truck rumbled down the lane. Six men were tumbling balks of timber out of the back of the truck. Following them came a crew of twenty, arranging the balks neatly in rows. Prestigian and his guests watched with amazement. A giant machine, bellowing and pounding, approached crawling over the ties. Behind it were deposited parallel rails of welded steel. Crews with sledges and pneumatic punches spiked the rails to the timber ties. The track was laid to Prestigian's door in a sweeping arc and then curved away. The bellowing engine and crews disappeared into the darkness. Good God, Precision was distinctly heard to say. The guests poured out of the house to watch. A shrill whistle sounded in the distance. Down the track came a man on a white horse, carrying a large red flag. Behind him panted a steam locomotive, drawing a single observation car. The train stopped before Precision's door. A conductor swung down from the car, followed by a Pullman porter. The porter arranged steps. A lady and gentleman in evening clothes descended. Shan't be long, the gentleman told the conductor. Come back for me in an hour. Good God! Precision exclaimed again. The train puffed off. The couple mounted the steps. Good evening, Precision, the gentleman said. Terribly sorry about that horse messing up your grounds. But the old New York franchise still insists on the red flag in front of trains. Four mile, the guest shouted. Four mile of Saris, the sightseers cheered. Prestigian's party was now an assured success. Inside the vast velvet and plush reception hall, Prestigian examined Four Mile curiously. Foyle endured the keen iron gaze with equanimity. Meanwhile, nodding and smiling to the enthusiastic admirers he had acquired from Canberra to New York. Control, he thought. Blood, bowel, and brains. He grilled me in his office for one hour after that crazy attempt I made on Vorga. Will he recognize me? Your face is familiar, Prestigian, Four Miles said. Have we met before? I have not had the honor of meeting a Four Mile until tonight. Precision answered ambiguously. Foyle had trained himself to read men, but Precision's hard, handsome face was inscrutable. Standing face to face, the one detached and compelled, the other reserved and indomitable, they looked like a pair of brazen statues at white heat on the verge of running molten. I'm told that you boast of being an upstart, Four Mile. Yes, I've patterned myself after the first Precision. Indeed. You will remember that he boasted of starting the family fortune in the plasma black market during the Third World War. It was the Second World War, Four Mile. But the hypocrites of our clan never acknowledge him. The name was Payne, then. I hadn't known. And what was your unhappy name before you changed it to Four Mile? It was Prestigian. Indeed. The basculus smiled acknowledged the hit. You claim a relationship with our clan? I will claim it in time. Of what degree? Let's say a uh, blood relationship. How interesting. I detect a certain fascination for blood in you, Four Mile. No doubt a family weakness, Prestigian. You are pleased to be cynical, Precision said, not without cynicism. But you speak the truth. We always have had a fatal weakness for blood and money. It is our vice, I admit it. And I share it. A passion for blood and money? Indeed, I do. Most passionately. Without mercy, without forgiveness, without hypocrisy? Without mercy, without forgiveness, without hypocrisy. Four Mile, you are a young man after my own heart. If you do not claim a relationship with our clan, I shall be forced to adopt you. You're too late, Prestigian. I've already adopted you. Prestigian took Four Mile's arm. You must be presented to my daughter, Lady Olivia. Will you allow me? They crossed the reception hall.
Triumph surged within foil. He doesn't know. He'll never know. Then, doubt came. But I'll never know if he does know. He's crucible steel. He could teach me a thing or two about control. Acquaintances hailed Formile. Wonderful deception you worked in Shanghai. Marvelous carnival in Rome, wasn't it? Did you hear about the Bernie man who appeared on the Spanish stairs? We looked for you in London. What a heavily entrance that was, Harry Sherwin-Williams called. Outdid us all, for a mile. Made us look like a pack of damned pikers. You forget yourself, Harry, Preston said coldly. You know I permit no profanity in my house. Sorry, Prestigian. Where is the circus now, Four Mile? I don't know, Foyle said. In just a moment. A crowd gathered, grinning in anticipation of the latest Four Mile folly. He took out a platinum watch and snapped open the case. The face of a valet appeared on the dial. Uh, uh, whatever your name is, where are we staying just now? The answer was tiny and tinny. You gave us orders to make New York your permanent residence, Four Mile. Oh, did I? And... We bought St. Patrick's Cathedral, Four Mile. And where is that? Old St. Patrick's, Four Mile, on Fifth Avenue in what was formerly 50th Street. We pitched the camp inside. Thank you. Four Mile closed the Platinum Hunter. My address is Old St. Patrick's, New York. There is one thing to be said for the outlaw religions. At least they built churches big enough to house a circus. Olivia Prestigian was seated on a dais, surrounded by admirers. She was a snow maiden, an ice princess with coral eyes and coral lips, imperious, mysterious, unattainable. Foyle looked at her once and lowered his eyes in confusion before the blind gaze that could only see him as electromagnetic waves and infrared light. His heart began to beat faster. Don't be a fool, he thought desperately. Control yourself. Stop dreaming. This can be dangerous. He was introduced, was addressed in a husky, silvery voice, was given a cool, slim hand, but the hand seemed to, but the hand seemed to explode within his with an electric shock. It was almost a start of mutual recognition, almost a joining of emotional impact. This is insane. She's a symbol. The dream princess. The unattainable. Control! He was fighting so hard that he scarcely realized he had been dismissed, graciously and indifferently. He could not believe it. He stood, gaping like a lout. What? Are you still here, Fulmile? I couldn't believe I'd been dismissed, Lady Olivia. Hardly that, but I'm afraid you're in the way of my friends. I'm not used to being dismissed. No, no. All wrong. At least not by someone I'd like to count as a friend. Don't be tedious, Formile. Do step down. How have I offended you? Offended? Me? Now you're being ridiculous. Lady Olivia. Christ, can't I say anything right? Where's Robin? Can we start again, please? If you're trying to be gauche, Formile, you're succeeding admirably. Your hand again, please. Thank you. I'm Four Mile of Ceres. All right, she laughed. I concede, you're a clown. Now, do step down. I'm sure you can find someone to amuse. What happened this time? Really, sir, are you trying to make me angry? No. Yes, I am. I'm trying to touch you somehow. Cut through the ice. The first time our hand claps was violent. Now it's nothing. What happened? Four Mile, Olivia said wearily, I'll concede that you're amusing. Original, witty, fascinating. Anything if you will only go away. He stumbled off the dais. Bitch, bitch, bitch! No, she's the dream just as I dreamed her. The icy pinnacle to be stormed and taken. To lay siege, invade, ravish, force to her knees. He came face to face with Saul Dagenham. He stood, paralyzed, coercing blood and bowels. Ah, oh, Fourmile, Precision said. 
This is Saul Dagenham. He can only give us thirty minutes, and he insists on spending one of them with you. Does he know? Did he send for Dagenham to make sure? Attack. Toujours Ades. What happened to your face, Dagenham? Four Mile asked with detached curiosity. The death's head smiled. And I thought I was famous. Radiation poisoning. I'm hot. Time was when they said, hotter than a pistol. Now they say, hotter than Dagenham. The deadly eyes raked foil. What's behind that circus of yours? A passion for notoriety. I'm an old hand at camouflage myself. I recognize the signs. What's your larceny? Did Dillinger tell Capone? Foyle smiled back, beginning to relax, restraining his triumph. I've outfaced them both. You look happier, Dagenham. Instantly, he realized the slip. Dagenham picked it up in a flash. Happier than when? Where did we meet before? Uh, not happier than when. Happier than me. Foyle turned to Prestigian. I've fallen desperately in love with Lady Olivia. Saul, your half hour's up. Dagenham and Prestigian, on either side of Foyle, turned. A tall woman approached, stately in an emerald evening gown, her red hair gleaming. It was Gisbella McQueen. Their glances met. Before the shock could seethe into his face, Foyle turned, ran six steps to the first door he saw, opened it, and darted through. The door slammed behind him. He was in a short, blind corridor. There was a click, a pause, and then a canned voice spoke courteously. You have invaded a private portion of this residence. Please retire. Foyle gasped and struggled with himself. You have invaded a private portion of this residence. Please retire. I never knew. Thought she was killed out there. She recognized me. You have invaded a private portion of this residence. Please retire. I'm finished. She'll never forgive me. Must be telling Dagenham and Prestigian right now. The door from the reception hall opened, and for a moment Foyle thought he saw his flaming image. Then he realized he was looking at Gisbella's flaming hair. She made no move, just stood and smiled at him in furious triumph. He straightened. By God, I won't go down whining. Without haste, Foyle sauntered out of the corridor, took Gisbella's arm, and led her back to the reception hall. He never bothered to look around for Dagenham or Prestigian. They would present themselves with force and arms in due time. He smiled at Gisbella. She smiled back, still in triumph. Thanks for running away, Gully. I never dreamed it could be so satisfying. Running away? My dear Jiz. Well, I can't tell you how lovely you look tonight. We've come a long way from Goffy Martell, haven't we? Foyle motioned to the ballroom. Dance? Her eyes widened in surprise at his composure. She permitted him to escort her to the ballroom and take her in his arms. By the way, Jiz, how did you manage to keep out of Goffrey Martell? Dagenham arranged it. So you dance now, Gully? I dance, speak four languages miserably, study science and philosophy, write pitiful poetry, blow myself up with idiotic experiments, a fence like a fool, box like a buffoon. In short, I'm the notorious Four Mile of Ceres. No longer Gully Foyle. Only to you, dear, and whoever you told. Just Dagenham. Are you sorry I blew your secret? You couldn't help yourself any more than I could. No, I couldn't. Your name just popped out of me. What would you have paid me to keep my mouth shut? Don't be a fool, Jizz. This accident's gonna earn you about 18 million credits. What do you mean? I told you I'd give you whatever was left over after I finished Vorga. You finished Vorga? She said in surprise. No, dear. You finished me. But I'll keep my promise. She laughed. Generous, Gully Foyle. Be real generous, Gully. Make a run for it. Entertain me a little. Squealing like a rat? I don't know how, Jizz. I'm trained for hunting, nothing else. And I killed the tiger. Give me one satisfaction, Gully. Say you were close to Vorga. 
Say I ruined you when you were half a step from the finish. Yes? I wish I could, Jiz, but I can't. I'm nowhere. I was just trying to pick up another lead here tonight. Poor Gully. Maybe I can help you out of this jam. I can say, oh, that I made a mistake or a joke, that you really aren't Gully Voile. I know how to confuse Saul. I can do it, Gully, if you still love me. He looked down at her and shook his head. It's never been love between us, Jizz. You know that. I'm too one track to be anything but a hunter. Too one track to be anything but a fool. What do you mean, Jizz? Dagenham arranged to keep you out of Goffrey Martell? You know how to confuse Saul Dagenham? What have you got to do with him? I work for him. I'm one of his couriers. You mean he's blackmailing you? Threatening to send you back if you don't? No. We hit it off the minute we met. He started off capturing me. I ended up capturing him. How do you mean? Can't you guess? He stared at her. Her eyes were veiled, but he understood. Jizz! With him? Yes. But how? He's... There are precautions. It's... I don't want to talk about it, Gully. Sorry. He's a long time returning. Returning? Dagenham. With his army. Oh, yes, of course. Disbella laughed again, then spoke in a low, furious tone. You don't know what a tightrope you've been walking, Gully. If you begged or bribed or tried to romance me, by God, I'd have ruined you. I'd have told the whole world who you were. Screamed it from the housetops. What are you talking about? Saul isn't returning. He doesn't know. You can go to hell on your own. I don't believe you. Do you think it would take him this long to get you? Saul Dagenham? But why didn't you tell him? After the way I ran out on you? Because I don't want him going to hell with you. I'm not talking about Vorga. I mean something else. Pyre. That's why they hunted you. That's what they're after. Twenty pounds of pyre. What's that? When you got the safe open, was there a small box in it? Made of ILI? Inert lead isotope? Yes. And what was inside the ILI box? Twenty slugs that looked like compressed iodine crystals. And what did you do with the slugs? I sent two out for analysis. No one could find out what they were. I'm trying to run an analysis on a third in my lab when I'm not clowning around for the public. Oh, you are, are you? Why? I'm growing up, Jizz, Foyle said gently. It didn't take much to figure out that was what Prestige and Dagenham were after. Where have you got the rest of the slugs? In a safe place. They're not safe. They can't ever be safe. I don't know what Pyre is, but I know it's the road to hell, and I don't want Saul walking it. You love him that much? I respect him that much. He's the first man that ever showed me an excuse for the double standard. Jizz, what is Pyre? You know. I guess. I piece together the hints I've heard. I've got an idea. And I could tell you, Gully. But I won't. The fury in her face was luminous. I'm running out on you this time. I'm leaving you to hang helpless in the dark. See what it feels like, boy. Enjoy. She broke away from him and swept across the ballroom floor. At that moment, the first bombs fell. They came in like meteor swarms. Not so many, but far more deadly. They came in on the morning quadrant, that quarter of the globe in darkness from midnight to dawn. They collided head-on with the forward side of the earth and its revolution around the sun. They had been traveling a distance of 400 million miles. Their excessive speed was matched by the rapidity of the Terran defense computers, which traced and intercepted these New Year gifts from the outer satellites within the space of microseconds. A multitude of fierce new stars prickled in the sky and vanished. They were the bombs detected and detonated 500 miles above their target. But so narrow was the margin between speed of defense and speed of attack that many got through. They shot through the aurora level, meteor level, the twilight limit, the stratosphere, and down to Earth. The invisible trajectories ended in titanic convulsions. 
The first atomic explosion, which destroyed Newark, shook the prestige and mansion with an unbelievable quake. Floors and walls shuddered, and the guests were thrown in heaps along with furniture and decorations. Quake followed quake as the random shower descended around New York. They were deafening, numbing, chilling. The sounds, the shocks, the flares of lurid light on the horizon were so enormous that reason was stripped from humanity, leaving nothing but flayed animals to shriek, cower, and run. Within the space of five seconds, Prestige's New Year party was transformed from elegance into anarchy. Foyle arose from the floor. He looked at the struggling bodies on the ballroom parquet, saw Gisbella fighting to free herself, took a step towards her, and then stopped. He revolved his head, dazedly, feeling it was no part of him. The thunder never ceased. He saw Robin Winsbury in the reception hall, reeling and battered. He took a step towards her and then stopped again. He knew where he must go. He accelerated. The thunder and lightning dropped down the spectrum to grinding and flickering. The shuddering quakes turned into greasy undulations. Foil blurred through the giant house, searching, until at last he found her, standing in the garden, standing tiptoe on a marble bench, looking like a marble statue to his accelerated senses. The statue of exaltation. He decelerated. Sensation lipped up the spectrum again, and once more, he was buffeted by that bigger-than-death-sized bombardment. Lady Olivia, he called. Who is that? The clown. Four mile? Yes. And you came searching for me. I'm touched. Really touched. You're insane to be standing out here like this. I beg you to let me. No, no, no. It's beautiful. Magnificent. Let me jaunt with you to some place that's safe. Ah, you see yourself as a knight in armor. Chivalry to the rescue. <laughs> it doesn't suit you, my dear. You haven't the flair for it. You'd best go. I'll stay. As a beauty lover? As a lover. You're still tedious, Four Mile. Come, be inspired. This is Armageddon. Flowering monstrosity. Tell me what you see. There's nothing much, he answered, looking around and wincing. There's light all over the horizon. Quick clouds of it. Above, there's a sort of sparkling effect, like... Christmas lights twinkling. Oh, you see so little with your eyes. See what I see. There's a dome in the sky, a rainbow dome. The colors run from deep tang to brilliant burn. That's what I've named the colors I see. What would that dome be? The radar screen. The radar screen, Foyle muttered. And then there are vast shafts of fire thrusting up and swaying weaving, dancing, sweeping. What are they? Interceptor beams. You're seeing the whole electronic defense system. And I can see the bombs coming down too. Quick streaks of what you call red. But not your red. Mine. Why can I see them? They're heated by air friction. But the inert lead casing doesn't show the color to us. See how much better you're doing as... Galileo than Galahad? Oh, there's one coming down in the east. Watch for it. It's coming, coming, coming. Now. A flare of light on the eastern horizon proved it was not her imagination. There, another to the north. Very close, very. Now. A shock tore down from the north. And the explosions four mile. They're not just clouds of light. They're fabrics, webs, tapestries of meshing color. So beautiful, like exquisite shrouds. Which they are, Lady Olivia. Which they are, Lady Olivia. Are you afraid? Yes. Then run away. No. Huh, <laughs> you're defiant. I don't know what I am. I'm scared. But I won't run. Then you're brazing it out. Make a show of knightly courage, the husky voice sounded amused. Just think for a mile. How long does it take to jaunt? You could be safe in seconds. In Mexico, Canada, 
Alaska, so safe. There must be billions there now. We're probably the last left in the city. Not everyone can jaunt so far and so fast. Then we're the last left who count. Why don't you leave me? Be safe. I'll be killed soon. No one will ever know your pretense turned tail. Bitch! Ah, you're angry. What shocking language. It's the first sign of weakness. Why don't you exercise your better judgment and carry me off? That would be the second sign. Damn you! He stepped closer, clenching his fist in rage. She touched his cheek with a cool, quiet hand, but once again there was that electric shock. No, it's too late, my dear, she said quietly. Here comes a whole cluster of red streaks. Down, down, down. Directly at us. There'll be no escaping this. Quick now, run, jaunt, take me with you, quick, quick. He swept her off the bench. Bitch, never. He held her, found the soft coral mouth and kissed her, bruised her lips with his, waiting for the final blackout. The concussions never came. Tricked, he exclaimed. She laughed. He kissed her again and at last forced himself to release her. She gasped for breath then laughed again, her coral eyes blazing. It's over, she said. It hasn't begun yet. What do you mean? The war between us. Make it a human war. Make it a human war, she said fiercely. You're the first not to be deceived by my looks. Oh, God. The boredom of the chivalrous knights and their milk-warm passion for the fairy tale princess. But I'm not like that. Inside. I'm not. I'm not. Never. Make it a savage war between us. Don't win me. Destroy me. Suddenly, she was Lady Olivia again, the gracious snow maiden. I'm afraid the bombardment has finished, my dear Four Mile. The show is over, but what an exciting prelude to the new year. Good night. Good night? He echoed incredulously. Good night, she repeated. Really, my dear Formo, are you so gauche that you never know when you're dismissed? You may go now. Good night. He hesitated, searched for words, and at last turned and lurched out of the house. He was trembling with elation and confusion. He walked in a daze, scarcely aware of the confusion and disaster around him. The horizon was now lit with the light of red flames. The shock waves of the assault had stirred the atmosphere so violently that wind still whistled in strange gusts. The tremor of the explosions had shaken the city so hard that brick, cornice, glass, and metal were tumbling and crashing, and this despite the fact that no direct hit had been made on York. The streets were empty. The city was deserted. The entire population of New York, of every city, had jaunted in a desperate search for safety to the limits of their ability. Five miles, 50 miles, 500 miles. Some had jaunted into the center of a direct hit. Thousands died in jaunt explosions, for the public jaunt stages had never been designed to accommodate the crowding of mass exodus. Foyle became aware of white armored disaster crews appearing on the streets. An imperious signal directed at him warned him that he was about to be summarily drafted for disaster work. The problem of jaunting was not to get populations out of the cities, but to force them to return and restore order. Foyle had no intention of spending a week fighting fires and looters. He accelerated and evaded the disaster crew. At Fifth Avenue, he decelerated. The drain of acceleration on his energy was so enormous that he was reluctant to maintain it for more than a few seconds. Long periods of acceleration demanded days of recuperation. The looters and jack jaunters were already at work on the avenue. Singly, in swarms, furtive yet savage, jackals rending the body of a living but helpless animal. They descended on foil. Anything was their prey tonight. I'm not in the mood, he told them. Play with somebody else. He emptied the money out of his pockets and tossed it to them. They snapped it up, but were not satisfied. They desired entertainment, and he was obviously a helpless gentleman. Half a dozen surrounded Foyle and closed in to torment him. 
Come on, gentlemen, they smiled. We're going to have a party. Foyle saw the mutilated body of one of their party guests. He sighed and detached his mind from visions of Olivia Prestigian. All right, jackals, he said. Let's have a party. They prepared to send him into a screaming dance. Foyle tripped the switchboard in his mouth and became for twelve devastating seconds the most murderous machine ever devised. The Commando Killer. It was done without conscious thought or violation. His body merely followed the directive taped into muscle and reflex. He left six bodies stretched on the street. Old St. Pat's still stood, unblemished, eternal, the distant fires flickering on the green copper of its roof. Inside it was deserted. The tents of the four-mile circus filled the nave, illuminated and furnished, but the circus personnel were gone. Servants, chefs, valets, athletes, philosophers, camp followers, and crooks had fled. But they'll be back to loot, Foyle murmured. He entered his own tent. The first thing he saw was a figure in white, crouched on a rug, crooning sunnily to itself. It was Robin Winsbury, her gown in tatters, her mind in tatters. Robin! She went on crooning wordlessly. He pulled her up, shook her, and slapped her. She beamed and crooned. He filled a syringe and gave her a tremendous shot of niacin. The sobering wrench of the drug on her pathetic flight from reality was ghastly. Her satin skin turned ashen. The beautiful face twisted. She recognized Foyle, remembered what she had tried to forget, screamed, and sank to her knees. She began to cry. That's better, he told her. You're a great one to escape, aren't you? First suicide, now this. What's next? Go away. Probably religion. I can see you joining a cellar sect with passwords like packs of all the scum, Bible smuggling, and martyrdom for the faith. Can't you ever face up to anything? Don't you ever run away? Never. Escape is for cripples. Neurotics. Neurotics. The favorite word of the Johnny-come-lately educated. You're so educated, aren't you? So poised, so balanced. You've been running away all your life. Me? Never. I've been hunting all my life. You've been running. Haven't you ever heard of attack escape? To run away from reality by attacking it? Denying it? Destroying it? That's what you've been doing. Attack escape? Foyle was brought up with a jolt. You mean I've been running away from something? Obviously. From what? From reality. You can't accept life as it is. You refuse. You attack it. Try to force it into your own pattern. You attack and destroy everything that stands in the way of your own insane pattern. She lifted her tear-stained face. I can't stand it anymore. I want you to let me go. Go? Where? To live with my own family. What about your family? and find them my own way. Why? Why now? It's too much. You and the war? Because you're as bad as the war. Worse. What happened to me tonight is what happens to me every moment I'm with you. I can stand one or the other. Not both. No, he said. I need you. I'm prepared to buy my way out. How? You've lost all your leagues to Vorga, haven't you? And I found another. Where? Never mind where. Will you agree to let me go if I turn it over to you? I can take it from you. Go ahead. Take it. Her eyes flashed. If you know what it is, you won't have any trouble. I can make you give it to me. Can you? After the bombing tonight? Try. He was taken aback by her defiance. How do I know you're not bluffing? I'll give you one hint. Remember the man in Australia? Forrest? Yeah. He tried to tell you the names of the crew. Do you remember the only name he got out? Kemp. He died before he could finish it. The name is Kempsey. That's your lead? Yes. Kempsey. Name and address. In return for your promise to let me go. It's a sale, he said. You can go. Give it to me. She went at once to the travel dress she had worn in Shanghai, 
From the pocket, she took out a sheet of partially burned paper. I saw this on Sergei Orl's desk when I was trying to put the fire out. The fire the burning man started. She handed him the sheet of paper. It was a fragment of a begging letter. It read, Do anything to get out of these bacteria fields. Why should a man, just because he can't jaunt, get treated like a dog? Please, help me, Serge. Help an old shipmate off a ship we don't mention. You can spare a hundred credits. Remember all the favors I've done you? Send a hundred credits or even fifty. Don't let me down. Raj Kimsey. Barrack 3. Bacteria. Mare Nubium Moon. By God! Foyle exclaimed. This is the lead. We can't fail this time. We'll know what to do. He'll spill everything. Everything. He grinned at Robin. We'll leave for the moon tomorrow night. Book passage. No, there'll be no trouble on account of the attack. I'll buy a ship. They'll be unloading them cheap anyway. We? Robin said. You mean you. I mean we, Foyle answered. We're going to the moon. Both of us. I'm leaving. You're not leaving. You're staying with me. But you swore you'd... Grow up, girl. I had to swear to anything to get to this. I need you more now than ever. Not for Vorga. I'll handle Vorga myself. For something much more important. He looked at her incredulous face and smiled ruefully. It's too bad, girl. If you had given me this letter two hours ago, I'd have kept my word. But it's too late now. I need a romance, secretary. I'm in love with Olivia Prestigian. She leapt to her feet in a blaze of fury. You're in love with her? Olivia Prestigian? In love with that white corpse? The bitter fury of her telescending was a startling revelation to him. Ah, now you've lost me. Forever. Now I'll destroy you. She disappeared.